essence are, this microcosmic self is the receptacle of all of the divine names. As the Quran states, and Allah taught Adam all the names, and God taught Adam all the names in Surah Al-Baqarah. Yet although God created this primordial human microcosmic self, in the words of the Quran, fi ahsani taqweem, in the highest stature, then God caused him to descend to the lowest of the low, the asfal asafilin. In other words, although the human self is in principle the microcosm, Allah causes it to be unaware of its true nature. We're unaware of our true nature. After Allah causes the self to be unaware of its true nature and unaware of Allah, all it sees is its temporal existence. Therefore, it falls in love with that temporal existence, according to Bakli. Rather than falling in love, being in love with Allah, it falls in love with itself. Not being aware of Allah, the self resists obudiyah, it resists servanthood to, to Allah. Seeing only its temporal self, the self has difficulty giving up the pleasure of its temporal existence. But if the self can experience the supreme pleasure, which is to become aware of Allah, this knowledge will enable it to give up its resistance to being a servant of Allah. This knowledge will enable it to give up the pleasure of temporal existence, of the dunya. I was paraphrasing his commentary there. It seems like an impossible situation. One has to extricate oneself from this self-love. On the one hand, the self has lost awareness of Allah and of its true khalifa, of its true khilafa, its true microcosmic self. To regain this awareness, however, it has to become a true abd, a true servant. Yet on the other hand, the self will resist servanthood until it attains awareness with awareness of Allah. In other words, if we had awareness of Allah, this would help us give up our infatuation with our ego. But the problem is our infatuation with our ego blocks our awareness of Allah. We're in a bind. The way out of this problem, this conundrum, this unfixable problem, is that the self must attempt a return journey to knowledge and love of Allah through self-knowledge. Self-knowledge frees one's attention from temporal phenomena, hawadith. The reason why self-knowledge frees one from the temporal phenomena is that God's representative, is that as God's representative on earth, as the Khalifa, human beings are potentially ennobled as recipients of all God's names and attributes. Hence, true self-knowledge is direct knowledge of Allah's names and attributes, ma'rifa. The inverse also holds. Namely, by neglecting to be truly aware of his or herself, in fact, the servant neglects God. Here, Bakli again cites the sixth Shiite Imam, Jafar as-Sadiq, who said, do not neglect yourselves. Indeed, whoever neglects his self neglects his Lord, and whoever neglects his Lord slays his self. One travels the path to self-knowledge by attempting to fulfill one's obligations of servanthood to God. These obligations comprise avoiding whatever Allah has prohibited, which are generally speaking, being caught up in the self and being caught up in desire and in detail are spelled out in Sharia. Thus by avoiding what Allah has prohibited, namely by avoiding the self, by avoiding desire, which of course means desire exceeding the demands of the, the limits of the Sharia, by avoiding this as well as by additional spiritual striving and by the practice of austerities, riyadat and mujahadat, which Bakli mentions, one's heart will become gradually aware of Allah. But on the return journey to Allah, ultimately it is Allah 
who will liberate the servant's heart and free the self from the heaviness of self. If one manages not to become entrapped by major sins, kabair, God will free the traveler's heart from the darkness that these sins bring about. In freeing the traveler's hearts from the darkness of their sins, Allah will convey them to union with the divine beauty and generosity. Allah will allow them to embody the attributes of Allah. Tahallaku bi akhlaqullah. Similarly, if one constantly strives to fulfill the obligations of obudiya, of servanthood, God will then free one from disobedience. Disobedience is experienced as heaviness, the heaviness of self. So when Allah frees the servant from disobedience, He frees him or her from the heaviness of self. Okay. Now even in obedience to Allah, however, the servant is burdened. But unlike the heaviness of the self, deriving from disobedience, the weight of the servant, the weight that the servant experiences through obedience is what Bakli calls the weight of Robubiya, the weight of lordship. The weight of lordship, Robubiya, is the burden that man accepted when he answered in the affirmative God's query, Alastu birabbikum, am I not your Lord? At this point, human beings committed themselves. We committed ourselves to carrying the burden of continuing to answer yes, Bala, by fulfilling our obligations to God. Yet just as Allah can remove the weight of self, Allah can also lift from the servant the weight of rububiya, the weight of God's lordship. Thus, when the Arif, the Gnostic, the knower of Allah, is aware of Allah, witnessing Allah, Allah lifts the heaviness of both lordship and servanthood from the Gnostic. I'm not saying that God lifts servanthood. That would be a mistake that Sufis were very careful to maintain. The Abd is always the Abd, and the Rab is always the Rab. But Allah lifts the heaviness of Obudiyah and the heaviness of Rububiyah. Again, I'm paraphrasing Bakli's commentary. In fact, elsewhere, Bakli criticizes Al-Halaj for not making and keeping that distinction. <clears throat> 